In today's Modern Horizons pack, we look at one of my favorite aspects in life, which is the ability to use what we have. In order to overcome the challenges of life, we need resources. Humans are in many ways known for their resourcefulness. Our main superpower is to take stuff from around us and use it for ourselves. How do we gather new resources? How do we find the chances that could bring us further towards our goals? We could barge straight through toward it, or we could take a massive detour. Our curiosity naturally brings us to new places. Although, when you're watching this, you were curious enough to find a small channel. But it can still be hard to stay curious. One overly curious creature is Sojourner's Companion. Its flavor could be deep if you look hard enough. Sojourner's Companion is the companion of a temporary inhabitant on Mirrodin, which we can see from the flavor. Before Phyrexia's corruption, many of Mirrodin's creatures were more curious than cruel. The first question is, whose companion is this? Well, as the flavor states, we see this 4-4 salamander just before it gets really corrupted by any Phyrexians. But we also know that this is not just one of Creator Karn's constructs, as the art from Lias Lasaido shows a greatly flexible metal friend, with folds on his fat and all. So that means that we see this boy in the time period when Memnarch tried to lure in creatures and planeswalkers to his world. His goal was to harvest a spark from one. Which brings us to the sad truth. That curiosity killed this friend's owner. And now our sojourner's companion is looking for new friends. Which it might find in the Phyrexians a bit later. We can see how this 7 mana 4-4 works too. Because he is looking for artifact friends with his affinity. Or you might cycle it for an artifact land, you cruel being. Alright, we have to go through a little bit more deadly curiosity with Guardian Karin. You see, curiosity is necessary, but it always brings risk. Even the famously wise Ojitai sometimes step or fly in the wrong spot while trying to learn. The flavor here says that follow the Karin is an Ojitai expression for died a hero's death. I imagine that this celestial being that Anastasia of Chinikova created lures in creatures only to have them die. Then it grows from their passing with a plus one counter for it, which is strong on the flyer. This blue Kirin, which is beautiful golden patterns, does seem able to lure some curious learners in. But why is this a hero's death according to the Ojitai? Well, they value knowledge and learning. So someone from these dragon lovers would have followed this being and someone had to go and learn not to follow it. Of course this is a saying and not every Ojitai ever follows this Karin, but after having one member die, they would never let it happen again. In another way, they might be saying that a hero is stupid for always rushing forward, but I like the first one better. Then we have this clue token by John Evan. He made a medallion that has washed ashore on seemingly a riverbed, but the shell on the art makes me think this might be a weird beach. Some lesser fortunate beaches have stones on them instead of nice soft sand. But I start to digress, because if this medallion would be in any water, I would immediately ask a million questions about what happened. What is this symbol from? And why is the sort of coin locked into the medallion like this? Is this some sort of key? Well, John Evan did a great job having us guess about this clue's meaning. Which is exactly what this is for. Also, I of course did ask on Reddit, as you do with stuff you do not know. And the symbol is from the cult of Emrakul on Innerstrad. So maybe don't pick this up. The answer came from MMM3 Creator 2, which I am thankful for. And he also makes great custom cards, so I will put this link in the description. 
I always get reminded about Jace and his adventures on Innistrad when I think about clues. Mostly because of the last few episodes in the story, but Jace has always been looking for clues. In the Izzet League, of course, on Innistrad with Tamio's journal, and his whole own mind has been a puzzle too, with many parts of his own life being locked away. It is this way for us too. We don't remember everything about our lives and we are maybe just as complicated as Jace. So we might want to take the time like Jace did to have a vacation on Ixalan and become a pirate for a little bit. The point being that you have to not focus on a problem for a little bit, to find new resources. Even though our first two cards indicated that that would be dangerous too. Gathering clues and learning in a roundabout manner is only the first step. You might have wandered into the woods for a long time now and now you feel like you have so many ideas to build on in your life. But then the most important part comes of practicing with those resources. Parcel Mirror brings us back to Mirrodin, a little bit later in time than our previous salamander. This shiny art is made by Wisnu Tan. It shows us this tiny clue mirror, which is an interesting creature type. This looks a little different than most clues because this clue can go on an adventure itself. These mirror are the worker ants of Memnark and as he descended into madness, these mirrors still followed him. While Memnark had an empathic connection to these, the resistance had to crack these open according to this flavor. Garaf Rist is a new rock which is just a smart human and a slave to the Fedalcon. These are used as scouts and apparently can gather info from these mirrors. The creation myth of the mirror once cured Jace, him again, from the Eldrazi madness. Perhaps these small helpers could have done that for Memnark too. For now we can see them gathering intel for our corrupted throne. But there are more ways in which we can be resourceful. It is not only information. Vedalken Infiltrator says an expert always keeps their tools close at hand. And while maybe not so literal, experts do want to have their tools handy when inspiration strikes. Always bring a notepad when you are a creative, because you want to keep practicing. I think this Vedalken's art also shows how we look at our tools with glistering eyes and biting our lip for the opportunities that these tools could give us. This infiltrator is probably a spy that sometimes tortures people, so whenever she finds someone to torture, she will have her tools with her. Izzy did a great job of portraying this lust for curious practice. Also, a two-powered unblockable rogue is always nice to have. Then there is this cookbook which I like to have linked to our Ferdalcon overlord. Because cooking is such a daily task for us humans that could greatly increase energy in our days. But in case of Asmorano Mardika Daistina Guldakar's cookbook, this cooking means much more. It helped her survive after being defeated by a demon named Vincent, which is so much easier to say. She survived in his service as his cook because she could cook him something interesting every day for seven years and seven days. Then when she was free to go, she went on to sell her recipes, which made the humans on the overworld use that book and as it included recipes like honey baked gargoyle breast and grey ogre toast in a black sauce, which sounds creepy, but not humans who were not often found in demon land. The ogres and evil beings of the overworld got angry. Cook Girl then forced to make a second volume called the Underworld Cookbook, Volume 2, which included a thousand and one ways to prepare an elf and a dish including a goblin prince. She obviously had no idea how to prepare these, but the ogres were satisfied as they probably did not care much for taste anyways. Her curiosity made her a great cook, and her resourcefulness saved her twice. And now the overworld is full of people eating each other. The end. After this fairy tale, I do want to direct your eyes to Joe Slugger's volcano in the background, and the fact that Asmore did use one banana in her dishes. 
Oh, and why can it resurrect a creature by sacrificing it? Well, because Asmore had to sell one to her demon lord to walk away with her life. Now it's the end. We move on to the most classic version of resourcefulness in magic, which is using your environment as a weapon. There are two ways to do that in this pack, and the first is using something up. Bone shards let you sacrifice a creature or discard a card, which are the dead creatures around this man. Then you may destroy a target creature or planeswalker. Its flavor says, in the Cathari dumping grounds known as the bone heaps, it's not hard to improvise an offense. The Cathari are not who you think they are, because they are actually bird people. These fight necromancers for corpses on Grixis. The Cathari believe that only the dead who are stripped from all earthly flesh may pass on to the afterlife, which is a great philosophy for vultures. Tommy Arnolds makes a great pose for a necromancer stuck in a sandy dumping ground without normal food for flesh eating birds. This man is crazy for wanting to survive and his lanky arms moving up bones as a final defense seems a great way to survive one day and descend into madness further over the next few days. I would not want to be on Grixis. Remind me of that when I start the planeswalk. So one way is by using a resource. The other way is using resources to make more resources. This is greatly green and flourishing strike is oh so color befitting. It could damage a flying creature for 5, which is massive amounts of damage, or it could boost your creature and make it flourish. Now the green thing is using your mana to the fullest, because for 5 mana you can have both effects. Jim Valak made a great art as we see a man on the mountains, but still the art is so green. The sword which becomes energy is green, the dragon is green, the armor is green and even the clouds are green, <laughs> forcing us to see how uncolored these effects are. Another descendant of the Ariok is Jor Kadim. I feel like he is very famous as he is played in many artifact decks as a 5 mana 8-4 with first strike, which is great. Him saying that this mirror from the enemy fights like a lion or sorry, a leonin is great, not because this potential 3-3 could even defeat him, but because of the opposite. This mare could never defeat Jor, if he would be serious, but these are annoying enough for him to have to focus. So his observation is probably more of a joke to his fellow soldiers. And then the epic sun on this plane makes this mare feel like a real hero. Izzy is doing great in this pack with the mirroring cards. But well, some small creatures and robots need weapons to survive. Some creatures use more natural resources. Look at this man's great tusks. He is rightfully shouting over his own mountain range. Because this 7 mana 7 5 is a beast. Chris Seaman did a great job of making something look slow enough for you to be able to react, but menacing enough for you to still change your game plan around it. He made this elephant-like bull creature roar to announce his presence. This represents the suspend mechanic in a way for me. Then in 4 turns this beast will have moved down from his mountain and is attacking you head on. But in the meantime you will have a chance to gather your resources for this upcoming 7 power trampler that is coming whether you like it or not. Great story. From a giant beast that might take a little while to get to you, to an anarchiomancer in the form of a goblin that needs to refrain from casting his spells too fast in order to have his clan fight each other before the enemy arrives. The flavor says a good gruel shaman can work a whole clan into a frenzy. A great one will wait until the enemy is nearby. This is such a great gruel flavor because I can so feel the urge to play your 3 mana 3 trees right away and then the only drawback being the board wipe that will come because you have played your whole hand out while next turn would have been lethal. That is the gruel vibe for you and it is even more true when all your cards cost one less. But that aside, this card is amazing and its effect is very popular in the form of amulets. But gruel likes creatures more anyways. 
the art from Joe Slucher again shows us another object in the light of something we would rather not look at. This goblin has hatred between his hands and is looking at it as if he cannot wait until he may release it. It is not the knowledge of when to release the spell, it is having the patience yourself to wait for the enemies that is hard for this goblin. Why is rage a resource? Well, it is an emotion in yourself that you can use. If you ever had a customer job, you know that anger can sometimes be a great motivator. The same goes for any job including customers or guests by the way. Just take your rage and turn it into a source of energy for the rest of your day. But don't let it consume you or you might turn out to need some weekend hobbies that you cannot get rid of. Not that I am speaking from experience. But this devil is a great representation of let out anger. This devil is played for 2 mana, again, can get in as a 3-3, but then you have let your anger go so you will have to lose a little bit of your sanity next turn. The flavor is very Rakdos too, with the announcement that audience in front row may have throats whipped out. Knowing the Rakdos, they probably announced this after the show began. Anger is a resource, but do not let your resources become who you are, because that is very Anger, emotions, just knowledge and curiosity. But in magic, we have some people who use their own people as resources too. We represent these as zombies or ghosts to make them seem less human. But these kinds of people do exist in the real world too, who use everyone as a resource. Let us look at Cursed Totem, a two mana artifact that stops all activated abilities from creatures, which is strong. But its flavor says, sorry great one, but did I hear correctly? I am to entrust this powerful artifact to our worst researchers. By Flestrim, Cable Servant. This great one wants to use the lesser researchers so that these can be cursed and this actual competence researchers remain usable. This cursed totem is a totem that was found deep in the jungles and was not supposed to be found by humans. But now that it is, it will stop them from being useful and will curse them in that way. This does not seem deadly, but in a way this totem is a bringer of intense bad luck. If all your retainers will not be able to retain your demons and the pit fights turn against the cable, I will be waiting for the glorious moment. It does seem like many of these resources get turned against us, and I think that is true to an extent. Resources can be used in any way. So whether it will be good or bad is still uncertain. Matt Stewart made an art piece where it seems our previous resources will be used again in a world changing manner. One ambition unleashes a legion of horrors. I always wonder whether necromancers will be able to control their zombies forever. In the case of Dracula, he gets eaten by his own ghouls in some stories. But when you use them well, it makes multiple kinds of legions, maybe some loyal vampire friends in the mix, you should be fine, hopefully. Echoing Return seems to almost let these resurrect involuntarily and can return a creature and all like named ones from your grave. Maybe this necromancer wanted one zombie and got at least three and now they are reconsidering, but life finds its way. Life finds its way via more than one road even. When a knight cannot breathe anymore, because it has no head, for example, it might find another way to win. This knight is a great representation of that. This is a flying ghost knight with lifelink, which is a great body to build on, and the army behind him represents that. Note the choice of making the horse headless as well. Great choice from Yong Hao Han. This one knight grows in power, or his army does, from every creature you return from your graveyard. Then the flavor hits home. This charge as being deadly and eerily silent, because the ghost does not make much sound. And the zombies apparently keep silent too, as they charge in. That is frightening and cute, because this knight keeps his army around him forever. That is just a show of immense love. From a loving general to someone who truly does not care about the soldiers. Cheddarfang is a general who can just drop and sacrifice some of his squirrels 
to make another creature or himself stronger or dead. But then still squirrels keep following him, probably because he knows how to keep the power of the nuts to himself. But mostly because he had a secondary stash of resources, which is his reputation. Do you see these fangs on his necklace? These are supposed to be dragon teeth. It is said that he took down 14 dragons by himself and had his army of squirrels take down the rest of the dragon army. It is said that the dragons attacked the squirrels, but in my opinion, they would have no reason to do such a thing. Therefore, I think Chatterfang attacked the dragons and as he defeated them, he could rewrite history in his favor. Squirrels are evil beings, and if you want to follow them because they seem cute, then just look at this one that sacrifices his own so-called cute friends for a chance of slaying some unsuspecting innocent dragons. Power can get to your head and you should be wary of it, so that you will not fall as deep as Chatterfang. So be careful, but curious too. Keep your goals in mind, but also make sure not to sacrifice too much in the process. Magic can teach us a lot and scrolls show us how not to be. Stay safe. Thank you for watching.